Welcome to today's podcast. My friends, it is good to be with you. It seems like I've been away for some time. In fact, during the course of this last month, I've been gone most of it. Had the opportunity to take a group of people to Israel, Jordan, and Egypt. And so today, we're going to do a podcast that's a special podcast. It is going to be relative to Moses' desert tabernacle in the Timna Valley. The slide that's up right now gives you some indication as to where the Timna Valley is. It's located at the very bottom of the Israeli Negev, right very, very close, about 15 miles or so from Elat, which is just across the Red Sea from Aqaba, Jordan. So it's right down there at the bottom. This is a very seldom site that is visited. The uh, The site is uh, approximately 35 square miles of, of a valley surrounded by high, very, very unique mountains. The, uh, the valley is rich with copper, and uh, the copper has uh, been mined in the Timna Valley for over 3,500 years, um, 3,500 BC. The peak of production in this valley of copper was about the same time as Solomon when he was building his temple. So no doubt some of Solomon's uh, Edomite uh, subjects had the task of mining copper uh, for the temple. Um, this copper was very important because copper mixed with zinc makes bronze. And they knew how to do that back then. So mining the copper was very, very important. There are over 10,000 mining shafts in the Timna Valley that have uh, been found. Uh, references to uh, biblical copper is found in the Bible. You can find it in Deuteronomy 8, Job 28. Ezekiel 22, and in the book of Luke, chapter 21, all reference copper or copper mining. Now, some of these shafts that are there in the Timna Valley go for long, long distances, up to 40 meters below the surface of the ground. Incredible mining going on. Professor Ben Yosha, who is one of the lead excavators in the area, has found 10 different camps of miners. And he's come to the uh, conclusion that these camps were kind of prisoner camps, that perhaps these people that were quarrying this copper were actually forced labor, and they were here in this hostile desert environment uh, under spear, perhaps, uh, mining the copper for whomever at the time was in power. Um, Solomon's Pillars, as it's referred to, this is a geological um, formation that is formed when rocks crack and then water gets down and splits them out. And these, these formations that are there on the screen are referred to as Solomon's Pillars. Now, every once in a while, you come across a bush that is growing, of all things, in this sweltering wilderness. A bush that is burned by the desert heat and yet is not consumed. Perhaps something like the burning bush found in Exodus chapter 3. Well, in this desolate, uh, forgotten valley are signs of an Egyptian, an Egyptian presence. Bino Rothenberg, who was one of the main excavators of the Timna Valley, excavated a small Egyptian temple dedicated to the Egyptian god Hathor at the base of uh, Solomon's Pillars. It was built during the reign of Seti I at the end of the 14th century BC. The shrine had an open courtyard and a place for a deity, a notch in the in the side of the cliff, that uh, the deity could sit there. And uh, during the course of the excavation, of course, hieroglyphics were found, uh, sculptures and jewelry. There were thousands of artifacts that were found at this particular site. So an Egyptian presence there mining copper uh, during the time of Seti I, 1400 BC, is, is very important to us. Very important to us. Well, out in this desert wasteland is a little bit of heaven, you might say. Uh, there stands a replicated version of Moses' wilderness tabernacle. And so I'm going to turn the next 30 minutes over to an, a, uh, a Jewish guide named uh, this outdoor tabernacle. This is an incredible experience that I filmed. I have to... Um, 
warn you that there is a little background noise, um, so just kind of stay focused as much as you can on our guide, and he'll step you right through this entire replicated uh, tabernacle that is patterned exactly after the Bible says that Moses' tabernacle was, was patterned. So without any further ado, I introduce you to Ariel, our, uh, our Jewish guide. Represents uh, Jesus in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, how it all points to Jesus and the gospel. And ultimately, the most important part is the relationship with God himself. And how that is uh, only done through uh, the blood of sacrifice. So, uh, before we begin, what do you guys know about the tabernacle? We are studying the Old Testament now within our, our religion, uh -huh. and uh, we've been reading the five books, and I think we're up through pretty much most of Exodus. Okay. So they've read of the tabernacle. Do you, do you remember, do you know what chapter you guys are in right now in Exodus? Or? Well, Where are you at, guys? 34 this morning. Okay, 34. So, so you guys, so you guys uh, read about the tabernacle. There are, there are a couple of descriptions of the tabernacle in the Bible. Yes. There's the description in Exodus that you guys read. That's the instructions that God gave Moses. And then there's uh, the um, the description in Leviticus, which is the actual making of the tabernacle. And that gives a couple more details that are not written in Exodus. But um, the, uh, the instruction that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai uh, were very precise. God told Moses all the dimensions, measurements, and materials that were used in the tabernacle. The dimensions they used was a measurement of length called a cubit. You guys know how much? Yeah? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, elbow to the tip of your finger. Between 45 to 50 centimeters in America, in America it's 18 inches? 18, 18 yes. inches. Um, so this whole model is built to scale based on the, on the dimensions that are written in the Bible, in the book of Exodus. Um, the material they used was mostly acacia wood. Here behind you guys, you have an acacia tree. It's a very, very crooked, very thorny tree. Why would God tell the people of Israel to build a tabernacle as such an ugly, crooked tree? It's what was happened. available. Mm -hmm. It's what was available. Partly because it was yeah. the only one that was available. But if you think about the spiritual meaning behind it, it represents us. Just as um, people of Israel use the acacia tree to build the tabernacle, God takes us, crooked, sinful people, He straightens us out, turns us into something ugly, from, uh, some, turns us into something beautiful from something ugly, and then He ultimately dwells in us just as He dwelt in the tabernacle. And that was the purpose of the tabernacle, was to be a dwelling place for the Lord. And so you can see right off the bat how the tabernacle itself represent, represents us. Um, much of the, much of the uh, acacia wood was overlaid with copper and with gold. And there was a lot of uh, silver as well that was used to build the tabernacle. So let's head on in. The tabernacle, you can kind of call it the portable temple that the Israelites carried with them through the desert. How long did they for? Forty years. Forty years, correct. Um, so they carried this with them through the desert, but they didn't carry it as one piece, as you see it. They took it apart piece by piece and carried uh, each piece separately. And uh, a bit later I'll talk about the logistics of exactly how they did that. How they were divided and uh, into the groups and families to carry the pieces and all that. Um, but the first thing that we see when coming in here was the altar, the copper altar. And it was made of acacia wood overlaid with copper. And inside the altar was the eternal fire, the eternal flame. God was the one who started the fire when they first built the tabernacle. But it was called the eternal fire because they were never allowed to let the fire burn out. They always had to go out and find wood and fuel to keep the fire burning continuously. And the fire, by the way, kept burning 
<clears throat> all the way through the destruction of the first temple. That was the first time that the fire burned out. Um, and in here they sacrifice uh, animals, different types of sacrifices, different meanings, different reasons. Uh, there were five different types of sacrifices, but the most important sacrifice was called a sin offering or an atonement offering. And that was done only once a year by the high priest for the people of Israel. All the other sacrifices the people of Israel could offer for themselves or for each other, like a peace offering, Thanksgiving offering, so on and so forth. But, uh, but the sin offering um, was done only by the high priest because the forgiveness of sins had to come from someone above. There was nothing that they could do in their own power to receive atonement of sin. You guys can walk up the ramp and take a look inside the altar. Yeah, yeah. Got a match? I hope, uh, did you guys uh, bring any sacrifices? And today. <laughs> Not this week, yeah. Yes, I'm uh, <clears throat> hmm. uh, next item the next item here this is called the copper wash piece or the copper sink the Hebrew word will literally translate to sink and this is the only item in the whole uh, story that the Bible does not give any dimensions for. Not the shape, not the size, not the weight. I don't know if it was wider, if it was taller, if it was maybe a square. Um, but what we do know is that it was made of pure copper, that it sat in between the altar and the temple itself, and that it was made of the mirrors of the women, women that donated the mirrors polished copper in order to make the wash base. So the priests, whenever they uh, came here to wash their hands and feet, they likely saw their own reflection in the wash base. They wouldn't, they didn't uh, wash their hands like this because it would have filled up with blood and dirt, but rather they took the water outside and washed their hands and their feet outside the, uh, the wash base. They had to do that before going into the, uh, to the tent or before offering a sacrifice. If you think about the placement of the wash base, if we are to be purified before going into the presence of God, why wasn't this the first thing that we see when coming in? Why, why would God tell them to first put the altar and then the wash base? Give away their sins. What was that? To burn their sins, their sacrifice themselves. Kind of, yeah, yeah, you're in the right direction. Um, God does not wait for us to be purified before offering the sacrifice. First comes the sacrifice, then comes the purification. It's through the sacrifice that we are purified, and then we can go into the presence of God. It almost it's like um, like the journey of, of a believer from from slavery of sin into uh, freedom in, uh, in the presence of the Lord. So does this kind of represents the ritual baths that we do? Yeah, it represents. It could represent that. It could also represent baptism because it was always filled with water. Um, it also represents uh, the judgment because uh, copper in the Bible represents judgment. And we know that the law of Moses, what we call in Hebrew the Torah, is never given to the people of Israel as a solution to salvation, but rather it was given as like a mirror to see, to, for them to see who they are. And, and that's what the law really is. The purpose of the law of Moses is for us to see ourselves as sinners, to see who we are before God. Um, Another, another interpretation of uh, what it could represent is uh, grace. Jesus says, whoever is thirsty, come to me and I will give him living water. So water can represent grace. And the reason I believe God did not give any dimensions for the wash base is because you cannot measure the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Yet over here, Uh, 
So <clears throat> the tent itself was made up of these big wooden boards, acacia wood, overlaid with gold. And each board was one and a half cubits wide by 10 cubits tall. So the whole, the, the whole tent stood as tall as somewhere between, I think, 15 and 16 feet. And each board was held in place by a couple of things. First of all, they were held in place by these hooks, kind of like, uh, like, kind of like Legos or Ikea furniture, so that they wouldn't uh, come well, apart. That's, that's, uh, what? That's, uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Like that. <laughs> yeah, that was so that they wouldn't fall apart from each other. In addition, uh, each side had five poles, also acacia wood overlaid with gold. There were four poles on the outside that were held in place by these rings, and the fifth pole that ran inside the boards all the way to the back. In addition, each board was held in place by two talents of silver. Now, a talent is a measurement of weight that was used in the Bible, somewhere between uh, 100 and 120 to 130 pounds. That means each board was, was held in place by somewhere between 240 to 260 pounds of pure silver. Who knows who did uh, the logistical work of carrying all the pieces of the tabernacle? Two guys. Correct, the Levites. Um, the Levites numbers uh, gives very precise numbers of uh, very precise no uh, numbers of all of the different families and groups um, that were given. If you added all up total, there, it's a, a very precise number <clears throat> of 8,580 men over the age of 30 that carried the pieces of the tabernacle that did all the logistical work. And they were divided into families. There was the main, uh, three main families, um, three main groups of uh, Levites. Uh, one was in charge of the, the tent itself. One was in charge of the, uh, of the uh, coverings of the, the outer gate. And one uh, was in charge of the holy items. But each of those groups were divided into uh, small families. Um, what we call, I think, uh, the nuclear, nuclear family uh, in English. And each one of those families was in charge of one single piece. So, for example, what is your name? Philip. Philip? So let's say, for example, Philip um, was alive during the time, and let's say um, that he and his family was in charge of the fourth block from the left, for example. When it was time to take the, apart the tabernacle, Philip and his family would take his block and they would carry it with them until it was time to settle down and rebuild the tabernacle. Um, the responsibility of each piece was passed down from father to son. And that's how they operated for 40 years. They would take it apart and build it back together. They, they would do that repeatedly over and over again until they finally reached the promised land. Yeah. So, when did they build the tabernacle after they left Egypt? How long? For the first time? Yeah. Um, I believe not long after the incident with the golden calf. Oh, okay. The instructions were not given to to Moses until after uh, until after the uh, the golden calf uh, story. Um, yeah, it's pretty quick after. I would imagine so. Um, I don't know for sure. I'd have to check that. But yeah. So now we guys, now we get to go inside the tabernacle. So, we can divide the whole compound into three parts. The first part is outside the courtyard, which is uh, in which the Israelites were allowed in, but only if they had an animal to sacrifice. They couldn't just come in wherever they wanted. The second part is this room that we're standing in. This is called the holy place. And in here, only the priests were allowed in this room. The third part is the room in the back, the most important part. It's called the holy of holies. And in there, only the high priest was allowed in once a year. 
What day of the year? Day of, the Day of Atonement, correct. In Hebrew, it's called Yom Kippur. On the south side of the tabernacle stood the golden lampstand, or the, um, the menorah. And this was made of pure gold, and it was made of one solid piece of gold. I Meaning they didn't take different pieces and attach it, but rather they took one solid chunk of gold and they shaped it, molded it into this beautiful piece of artwork. And just like outside, they were never allowed to let the fire burn out. They would uh, refill the lamps every day, the priests with olive oil, and the fire would burn in the front with a little wick, with a little piece of string. It was the only source of light in the whole room. So you can imagine, if all the walls were plated with gold, you can imagine all the light reflecting off the walls and lighting up the whole room. Remember what I said about uh, us being the tabernacle in the beginning? Who or what is the light? Christ. Christ, exactly, Jesus. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And we are the, we are the tabernacle, we are the ugly acacia one. Uh, gold in the Bible represents righteousness. So we are covered in righteousness. But Jesus is pure righteousness. That's why this, this that represents Jesus was made of pure gold and not wood overlaid with gold. Um, we can also, also see how it represents Jesus in that seven lamps. Um, the number seven in the Bible represents perfection, indicating that Jesus was perfect. And so just as the walls of the tabernacle reflected the light of the lamp, so are we, the believers in Jesus, are to reflect the light of Jesus uh, onto everyone around us. On the other side, opposite the lamp, stood be yeah, yeah. <laughs> Orland, uh, the table of showbread, also called the table of bread of presence. And on the table were 12 loaves of bread. Why 12? 12 tribes. Exactly, the 12 tribes, 12 tribes of Israel. But only the priests were allowed to eat of the bread, and they ate it on Shabbat, on Saturday. Later on, on Sunday, the first day of the week, they would make more bread, and it would sit here for a full week, fresh, and tasty until the next Shabbat. Um, it is written that when they ate the bread, they ate it with olive oil and with hyssop. Hyssop um, is, uh, is an herb um, in, he in Hebrew called Ezov, and it's the plant that is used to make a, a spice called zatan. Have you guys tried zatan? Mm -hmm. Yeah? No. Good stuff. What is it? Zatan is the name of the spice, but Ezov is the name of, of the plant itself. And so, um, but hyssop in the Bible represents purity. Uh, like in Psalm 51, David says, purify me, O Lord, with hyssop. Also, uh, in the book, in, in the, the story of Passover, during the 10th plague, the killing of the firstborn, the Israelites had to paint the doorpost with the blood of the lamb. They used hyssop branches to paint the, uh, the blood, indicating that only through blood can we be purified. There was one person, or rather a group of people, one person in this group, who ate the bread who were not priests. David. David, who said that? Mm -hmm. Correct. David was the only person and his small group who ate the bread who were not priests. It was before he became king. Um, he fled from Saul, King Saul, who tried to murder David, and uh, David fled. And he came here to the courtyard with a small group of men, of loyal men, and he told the high priest that he and his men had not eaten anything. He asked for something to eat. And the high priest said, I have nothing to give you but the showbread. And so the, the high priest gave David and his men five loaves of bread. And, uh, and they ate. And God had mercy on them, even though they were not really supposed to do that. If anyone did anything they were not supposed to, God would smite them on the spot. Um, but... The reason I believe God did not uh, kill David was, first of all, partly because of his situation. God understood David's situation. But more importantly, God knew the heart of David. David's heart was in the right place before the Lord. And he had, our, and he had also been appointed king. To, he had been anointed um, to become king one day, a few years before that. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So you can really see how um, each item really represents one of Jesus' famous 
I am is in the book of John. And Jesus repeatedly, repeatedly says, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. All right. What's with your cups? Uh, these were filled with, these are jars that were filled with olive oil. Uh, the olive oil that was used to light the lamp or to eat the bread with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. We're going to talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Sorry. Yeah. I think so. But... All right. <clears throat> the uh, altar of incense, or also called the golden altar. But here, they did not sacrifice animals like they did outside. Here, the priests twice a day had to offer up incense to different uh, materials, different um, plants spices, herbs, perfumes, that they would grind into a very fine powder. And they would sprinkle that powder on the altar of incense and it filled the whole room with a beautiful smell, a beautiful aroma. They had to do that twice a day, in the morning when they woke up and in the evening before they went to bed. That represents uh, prayer. It represents the prayer of the people of Israel ascending to heaven. And that our prayer is like a sweet smell to the Lord. The fact that they, that they had to do this twice a day represents that we are to open our day in prayer before the Lord and to end our day in prayer before the Lord. The high priest, first of all, a regular priest was dressed only in white with a head covering. But the high priest had a much more beautiful uniform. He had a layer of blue over the white. He had a sackcloth belt and, um, and the breastplate made of the holy colors. On the breastplate, he had the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, each tribe had their own precious stone attributed to it. On the shoulders, he had the 12 sons of Jacob, written according to age that they were born, from Reuben all the way to Benjamin. That represents the responsibility he had to carry on his shoulders for the people of Israel and how he had to carry them close to his heart. It shows how precious, um, how precious, um, people of Israel were uh, to him in his heart. On his forehead, he had a crown of gold that said holiness to the Lord. But what we uh, what we read in English as the Lord, usually in English it's in all caps or something like that, that is not translating from the Hebrew word Lord, which is Adonai, but rather it is referring to the personal name of God. In Hebrew pronounced Yehovah. Sometimes in English, Jehovah, Yahweh, but um, but the Hebrew letters are Yud Hey Vav Hey. Yehovah is short for Hayahoveh which means who was and is and will be. On the bottom, he had bells and pomegranates. A bell, a pomegranate, a bell, a pomegranate. Whenever he walked around, the people of Israel would hear the bells and they knew that they were in the presence of the high priest. He had a very, very important role. He was the mediator between God and Israel. He was the ambassador, the, ambassador, the middleman, the uh, representative between God and Israel. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, he was the only person in the whole compound. No one else was even allowed inside the courtyard on that day. And he would first of all sacrifice a personal sin offering for himself before he could take care of the sins of all of Israel. And then he would offer a sacrifice for all of Israel, <clears throat> and he would walk in with the blood of the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies, and he would sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant, and that atoned for the sin of the people of Israel. Jesus is our high priest, and just as the high priest was the only one who could make the sin offering for all of, e uh, for all of Israel, Jesus is the one who made the sacrifice for us, because there is nothing we can do in our own power to, to receive that forgiveness of sin. There's nothing we could ever do to pay the price. Jesus paid the price for us. And so um, that's what the high priest uh, represents. Can I ask a question? Yes. Was the high priest also responsible for packing around two very precious stones, the Urim and Thummim? Yes. Uh, well, the Bible actually briefly mentions the, what we call in English, uh, uh, the Urim and Tumim, in Hebrew it's just Urim and Betumim. Um, and it's actually one of the, or two, of the most mysterious things of this whole ordeal that, that is given the least um, amount of attention. Yeah. 
it's not just the least attention, but the least amount of like details. Yeah. Not just, not only do we not know what they look like or exactly what it was, but we don't even really know what the purpose exactly was. It was most people speculate that it that it was like through the stones that God uh, showed the people of Israel what decisions to make and, and what to do and what not to do. But 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 in Hebrew, Uminim and Tumim, we don't even know what those words or names mean. But it sounds like they were um, in plural. So it could have even been more than two stones. It could have been. Uh, a collection of, of items. It could have been, um, we don't know exactly what they, what they were, but what we do know is where he kept them. Now it's in the breastplate. <clears throat> the breastplate was was uh, a, long, a long piece of, uh, of cloth made of the holy colors that was folded in half like so. It was folded inward, creating a pocket. And inside that pocket is where the umim, umim and tumim uh, sat. Okay. Question? Yeah. Um, you said this altar here was for an incense? Yes. Uh, what's the purpose of the blood on the horns? The blood on the horns. So there were two altars. There's the outer altar and the inner altar that I spoke about. Uh, and both altars each uh, had four horns on each corner. The blood on the outer altar was there every day of the year from, from all the sacrifices. But the horn, the blood on the horns of the inner altar, we hear only on the day of atonement when the people. It was the only time. It was the only day of the year that the high priest or that blood was allowed inside, um, inside the tent itself. Um, so when, when the high priest came in on Yom Kippur on the day of atonement, he would not only sprinkle the blood on the ark of the covenant, but he would also sprinkle it here on the horns of the inner altar. Yes. How was the high priest chosen? Excellent question. Before I talk about the first high priest, um, I'll explain very briefly that the, the priesthood was passed down from father to son. But the very first high priest was chosen by God. Um, Moses came down from Mount Sinai and he told the people of Israel that Aaron was to be the first high priest, that Aaron, his brother. And the people of Israel complained, what is, what is this nepotism? What, what, just because he's your brother, he gets to be the high priest? And Moses says, I didn't, I didn't choose him, God chose him. So let's do, let's do this, let's take 12 representatives, one from each tribe, would each have a staff, would each have their own uh, rod. And they would all put their, their staffs and rods at the entrance of the courtyard. And the person whose staff blossomed with almond flowers the next day would be the first high priest. So they all went to bed and they woke up the next day and whose staff blossomed? Aaron's. Aaron. That's how they knew that God indeed had chosen Aaron um, to be the first high priest and that the priesthood would be afterwards passed down from father to son. Um, but later on during the time of the second temple, you know, they became religious, they became corrupt and the priesthood was, was bought. Um, was auctioned off and it was, it was bought with money and it was very uh, very corrupt but during the time of the tabernacle during the time of Moses um, it was uh, it was chosen by God so now um, because we are too many people we can't all fit into the Holy of Holies all at once what I'll do is I will be explaining about the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant and once I'm done explaining, then you guys can come in few by few and take a look at the altar and uh, at the uh, ark and, uh, and its contents. So, do you need somebody to hold the elbow? Uh, sure, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So, this is the holy of holies in which only the high priest was allowed in once a year. And in here sat the ark of the covenant sometimes also called the Holy, uh, the Ark of Holiness, but the official title in, uh, in the book of Exodus is the Ark of Testimony. And inside the Ark were three things. What was inside the Ark? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Correct, the two tablets wrote the Ten Commandments. What was that? Aaron's rod that I just spoke about that blossomed with almond flowers and? Manna. Manna, correct. The jar of manna bread. These are three items 
that each represent a different aspect of the relationship between God and man. The Ten Commandments um, is, some people would say, is the morality that God gives us. But, um, <clears throat> but in Hebrew, they're actually not called the Ten Commandments, but rather the Ten Statements. For example, the first one is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. That's not a commandment, that's a statement. It's a declaration. So the Ten Statements are ten things that God says about himself that when we, as people, step out of the boundaries of these Ten Statements, we sin. We sin and we, and we ruin that relationship with God. And so that is the very covenant, the very, almost, you could call it the, like the characteristics, the essence of God. Um, next up, the staff um, of Aaron. And I spoke about how Aaron was the high priest and that the high priest uh, ultimately represents Christ. Um, the staff can also represent Christ in that um, just as we, the staff blossomed with almond flowers, that represents Jesus um, dying and then rising from the dead. Because a stick, a dead stick can't supernatural, uh, a dead stick can't just blossom out of nowhere. Um, and the jar of manna bread, um, which is the bread from heaven that God provided for the people of Israel in the desert, represents God's provision in our lives, how God provides all our physical and spiritual needs. So when the high priest came in here on Yom Kippur on the Day of Atonement, he would sprinkle the blood right here on what we call here the mercy seat. And that represents God looking through the blood on what connects us to him, indicating that only through blood can we be in a relationship with God, and only through blood can we rebuild that relationship with God, uh, the relationship that has been broken by sin. So now I invite you all to come in few by few, Take a look. Go ahead. Okay, you go. Okay. And uh, if you have any questions, you could ask. Well, I hope you enjoyed our tour through Moses' wilderness tabernacle. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Moses' effort to try and create this group of people that uh, were pure in heart and of one thought and mind. Unsuccessful in doing it, but the tabernacle was there, certainly. And so, as we kind of conclude the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those five books, I can't think of any better way of doing that than summing up an opportunity to tour through the Tabernacle of Moses. Now, our next podcast is also going to be a special podcast. Um, with my opportunity to visit Egypt, I had an opportunity to see and experience many very unique things. And I'm going to take that opportunity to share some of that with you next time we meet. So look forward to our next podcast on the uniqueness of Egypt. Thank you.